Good day. And uh, here we are together again uh, with a, I pray, a, uh, a message that will bless you today and encourage you and encourage you not only in your own life, but encourage you and your friends and family as well. Thank you for inviting uh, me and as you invite me into your homes or wherever you're hearing this or watching this, you will are inviting Redwater Alliance Church as well. And we thank you for this opportunity. So I want to begin by asking you a question. Um, as a follower of Jesus Christ, how do you engage the culture? And let me put it another way. Do you engage the culture with the message you have been given by our Lord and Savior? In my reading over this past week, I came across a fellow by the name of Steve Graves who suggests that when it comes to taking a position in culture or on culture, that Christians, quote, tend to fall into one of four groups. The first group, Graves argues, withdraws from the culture. Christians in this group think of the, that the culture is, quote, so worldly and so wicked, end quote. And in order to maintain a sense of spiritual purity, one must avoid participating in the culture as much as possible. Grave uses one word to metaphorically describe this group, cocoon. Quote, they cocoon from the culture, that is, they have little to do with it. The second group, quote, looks down from down their noses, end quote, on the culture. And unlike the first group, which withdraws from the culture, these Christians shout loud and clear to the culture, quote, look how bad it is. These Christians are more than willing to engage what Graves calls culture wars. And often, he suggests with their superior attitude towards cultures that these Christians can be unkind and arrogant. They are quick to point out the faults and the wrongs of the culture, and thereby pointing to them how much better they are. Well, the third group is at the opposite end. Uh, this is where the pendulum is swung all the way to the other side. And these Christians tend to go along with the culture. These Christians usually never examine the culture through the biblical lens. They avoid any potential conflict by not doing things different than the culture. And some, even to strengthen their willingness to follow the culture, would argue from a theological foundation. And it goes something like this, that the culture trends at any given point of human history are what God had planned and purposed. Graves uh, defines these Christians as those that resemble, embrace, and endorse most everything that is going on in the culture. The fourth and final group, which Grave calls, interestingly enough, quote, some followers of Jesus. Well, this group, instead of separating from the culture or making others feel bad about the culture or accepting the trends of the culture, culture these Jesus followers transform the culture. How do they do this? Well, they engage the culture and fill the culture with the truth and values of Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus Christ understand that to a certain extent they are part of the culture, yet they bring to it a different message. So by living and working beside the culture, keeping a biblical vision of being salt and light in the culture, uh, they speak the truth with love into the culture. Well, maybe you, as I have, found yourself described somewhere in graves assessment. And why don't we just say this out loud to get it out of the way? Many who call themselves Christians have engaged the culture at some point in their lives other than in a transforming way as Graves would describe. Thanks be to God that his grace and his purpose for this world does not depend on you or me to be perfect, simply humble. God's message for our culture is a message of hope, a message of restoration and redemption. 
and a message of love that is reaching those that God called one day at a time, one soul at a time. And we should be encouraged that despite our missteps as his children, we also have received the same message. And for those of us who have received the blessing of salvation, we freely give it to others. We always have before us, as J.I. Packer put it, that through Jesus Christ, sinful humans are reconciled to God, justified and forgiven by him, and given permanent access to him. Well, friends, today please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We'll be uh, dealing with verses 14 through to 41. Um, this is a great narrative. This is a great uh, message that uh, Paul, uh, Peter pardon me, has for the, the Jewish crowd in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost. So let's begin in verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I'll pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest, will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Verse 29, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that a patriarch, David, died and was buried in his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we're all witnesses of it. Exalted at the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool to your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. 41, those who accepted this message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this wonderful narrative. The very beginning of the church, 
when the Holy Spirit empowered the apostles and all the believers. Here is Peter standing up, giving the gospel message to his fellow Israelites. We thank you, Lord, that for today you have the same message that we carry with us in our current culture. And help us, Lord, to remember that that is the message we carry. It's not our message, it's God's message. That there is a Savior, and the world needs the Savior. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you and give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, uh, the followers of Christ know two things. One, we have a message to bring to the culture. That is the mission of the church and the command of our Lord and Savior to each one of us. Two, it's not our message. It's God's message. Prior to the ascension of Jesus Christ, he said to his apostles, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As we've been walking a little bit through the book of Acts in this sermon series, we find that Jesus ensured that his apostles had the right message and that Jesus would send the right power, that is, his spirit, to bring his message to the first century culture. We also spent a considerable amount of time engaging the Bible concerning the, the Holy Spirit, the person and work of the Holy Spirit in the early church and in the believer. So keeping all this in mind, when we consider Graves' comments concerning believers engaging uh, the culture, one can logically discern very easily that there is confusion today, as there was from the very beginning of the church concerning the message that Christ has for us to carry. So in an effort to clarify the gospel message, let's take some time with our text and let's bring it into, bring it into two parts, starting with verse 14 to 21, and then we'll deal with the rest. And what we have here in verse 14 to 21 is the prophecy of Pentecost. Something else to consider as we begin, we should notice that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, you just have to read through verses 1 to 13 to see that. We also should notice that the gospel was preached to a Jewish audience. As Peter would use terms such as fellow Jews, fellow Israelites, brothers. Also, as we look at verse 14 and 15 specifically, we are most likely, uh, no, we are not most likely, we are out of the loop with Peter's statement here as Western 21st century citizens. Peter, possibly with a sense of humor, reminds his fellow Jews that they were not drunk. For we read in verse 15, it's only nine in the morning. Some of your versions might say it was the third hour. And folks, in this first century context, the first meal of the day was around 10 in the morning. For the everyday Jew of Peter's day, drinking was usually done later in the day. So this begs the question, if they were not drunk, what happened on to Pentecost? Well, the better explanation that we have here in this, in this text is that Peter quotes from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 and 32. And Luke records some of that for us here in chapter 2 of Acts, from 17 through to 21. There we find God speaking through the prophet Joel, where he said, I will pour out my spirit on all people, verse 17. This is a, brings another question. What was, as one commentator put it, the ultimate cause or the significance of the spirit's empowerment at Pentecost? Answer, God. God's saving purpose. God's purpose and will to save people. As Peter continues to quote Joel from verse 17 through to 21, notice that God's saving purpose in sending his Holy Spirit is offered to all people. Folks, there's no age requirements with this. There's no gender or social status. There's no color of skin. There's no economic requirements requirements. 
There's no geographical location. There simply is nothing. For verse 21 tells us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I think this should answer any questions or concerns we have for the Christians who, as Grave puts it, cocoon themselves from the culture. It doesn't make sense if everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Something needs to be done. Apostle John said, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Very familiar piece of uh, scripture. Friends, we carry this message as followers of Christ, as believers. And the question that we need to ask ourselves today in our current cultural situation, do we keep it to ourselves? Or do we do it as this first group that Graves describes, cocoon ourselves or insulate ourselves from our culture and not engage, not participate? If the Apostle Paul were asked that question or was here to hear us talk about this, he would say, no, do not cocoon yourself. For Paul said, how then can they call on one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Or how can anyone preach unless they are sent? Indeed, how can they? And Paul goes on to say, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Do you want to be described as having beautiful feet? Well, then bring the good news. You see, it's not only the pastor's job to preach the gospel. Pastor's role to preach the gospel to others. It is also all Christians' responsibility. We know from Acts that the church began primarily as a Jewish church in Jerusalem. And it's no wonder, as you even look at the text that we read today, that Peter would appeal to the, the scriptures, the Bible, for, to present his case for the gospel, for the people would know it. But we also know that it would take Jesus revealing to Peter further along in Acts that the pouring out of his spirit was for Jew and Gentile, to really settle that with Peter. Yet even here in the first hours of the church, in this prophetic moment, if you want to call it, Peter, who was filled with the Holy Spirit, affirms Joel's prophecy when he said to the Jews in verse 39 that the promise of the Holy Spirit was what? For all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. This was for all, Jew and Gentile. You know, when one reads through the book of Acts, it would be very hard also to miss the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's all over the book of Acts. And as I consider Christian history, as I I consider our our current Christian culture, in the West here particularly, I think this is where many Christians uh, get uh, out of step, if you will, with the Holy Spirit. This is where we can really get bogged down. So how does that happen? Well, by focusing too much attention on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and on the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. How often do we find uh, believers trying with all their will and all their might to have the Holy Spirit show up and perform miracles, signs, and wonders, or wonders and signs, however you want to put it, Yes, this prophetic empowerment was made manifest in the apostles speaking uh, on the day of Pentecost in foreign languages. Yes, there were dreams and visions which guided the early church, such as the apostle Paul and his missionary journeys and many others. Prophecy and tongues were made manifest in the early church and it's still here today. People were healed, they were raised from the dead, demons were excised. But somehow, today, it seems that many make it sound like the miracles, wonders, and signs in the early church were happening 24-7, 365 days of the year, year after year. It's interesting to note when the text describes wonders, we can define it as something strange or supernatural. That's kind of the same thing. And when we look in the New Testament at these, these particular wonders, 
and without getting into detail because we don't have the time, these things are only made manifest 13 times in the New Testament. Nine times in the book of Acts, attributed to the Holy Spirit. And the three other places are, are found two times in the gospel and once in 2 Thessalonians. And those three are attributed to the power of Satan. So here's my point. God, yes, promises to pour out his spirit on all people. And why? For his saving purposes, not to provide miracles, signs, and wonders on demand. See, God is not a genie in a bottle. We don't rub the bottle and God gives us three wishes. God is a saving God, folks. And he poured out his spirit on Pentecost to empower his people to bring his saving message to all people. And if along the way God so chooses to heal someone, to give someone a vision, a prophetic message, cast out a demon, raise someone from the dead and more, it would be as a confirming sign, as Packer put it, that through Jesus Christ, sinful humans are reconciled to God, justified and forgiven by him, and given permanent access to him. End quote. Friends, this is the prophetic message we carry since the very day of Pentecost, so long ago. Well, we have verse 14 to 21, the prophecy of Pentecost. Now from verse 22 to 36, we have the preaching of, the, of Pentecost. The preaching of Pentecost. The IVP uh, commentary in addressing these verses begins with some very good questions that I want to share with you. Uh, uh, first one, who is the Lord? Second, how can we know he can save? And thirdly, what does Pentecost have to do with his salvation? Well, we begin by seeing how Peter draws the crowd's attention to Jesus of Nazareth here in verse 22. Here was, as Peter said, a man accredited by God. A man accredited by God. So who, how, where was Jesus of Nazareth accredited or approved, if you will? Answer, to who? By God. How? Answer, by miracles, wonders, and signs. Where did God do this? Answer, among you, as we see in the text here, as you yourselves know, speaking to the crowd. So this brings us back to the question that the IVP commentary said, who is the Lord? Well, friends, it's the one who publicly displayed the power of God, who by miracles and wonders and signs over a period of three years reveals the presence of God, who proclaimed that the kingdom of God had arrived in the very beginning of the last days. So who is the Lord? Peter said it. Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth. Please notice verse 23. See, Peter now holds nothing back as he involves a crowd in Jesus' death. For he said to them, this man was handed over to you, and they did this with the help of wicked men. Verse 23, you find it there. The word wicked, by the way, means without the law or lawlessness, often referring to Gentiles. So in one statement, Peter puts a responsibility on both the Jews and the Romans who put him to death by nailing him to the cross, who crucified him. And yet, in, even in this text, we see a tension between the culpability of the Jews and the Romans in crucifying Jesus and God's deliberate plan, as Peter calls it, deliberate plan and foreknowledge. I don't know if you guys remember Isaiah 53.10, but it goes like this. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Isaiah 53.10. How about Matthew 16? Matthew writes that Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. That's in verse 21. So friends, what was prophesied in Isaiah concerning the Messiah 700 years before his birth, fulfilled by a shameful death on the Roman cross, was all part of God's saving purpose 
and foreknowledge. What an amazing thing. Jesus may have been killed on that gruesome cross, as we think about it, but we have now verse 24. And what a powerful and an important verse to know. For we read, but God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. Remember the question, how can we know he can save? That Jesus can save? The answer is verse 24. The resurrection of the Messiah, my friends, is the basic theme that we find throughout the book of Acts. And the resurrection is the cornerstone of our faith. For as Peter reminds us here in 24, that it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. It's impossible for death to keep its hold on his promised Messiah. Well, as we move into some of these other verses, we do so with the help of the Bible knowledge commentary. So from verse 25 to 35 there, we find four proofs of our Lord's resurrection and ascension. So let's go through this a bit quickly. First, we have the prophecy of King David in Psalm 16, 8 to 11, which is recorded for us here in verse 25 to 28. And along with it, we have Peter's statement from verse 29 to 31 concerning, concerning the, presence of David's, the presence pardon me, of David's tomb. That's where David was buried. Secondly, we have the eyewitnesses of the resurrection by the apostles. We find that in verse 32 where we read, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. That is Peter speaking. Thirdly, is the, we have the supernatural activities and events of the Pentecost as described for us in verse 33. And fourthly, Peter then quotes another of David's psalm, psalm, psalm 110, verse 1. There, Peter arguing that since David the prophet was dead and buried nearby, there was his tomb, he was writing about the Messiah and his resurrection. So friends, with these four proofs from Scripture and from first-hand witnesses and experience, Peter then could say with certainty to the crowd, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both, both Lord and Messiah. Well, with our time almost up, my friends, we press in and ask another question. What was the result of Peter's message? Verse 37. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Please notice with me the verb cut. The Greek here means to strike or prick violently, to strike or prick violently, to pierce. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about uh, that second group that Graves describes, that those that get right up into the face of unbelievers, picking the culture apart. Do we, do we do that? Do we look down our noses at the culture? Answer, no, of course not. But you might say, well, Peter put the blame on the Jews and the Romans for Jesus' death. Yes, he did. That sounds confrontational. It probably was. But my friends, Peter was a bold witness to the resurrection and ascension. He was a messenger of the gospel. P Peter was the message carrier. And the message was used by the Holy Spirit to pierce, to strike, to cut at the heart of the unbeliever. The Bible tells us that it is the role of the Holy Spirit in the world to condemn, to, to cut at the heart of unbeliever, to reveal uh, their sin, to reveal the sinful heart that is in need of a resurrected Savior. And Peter went on to say, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of, of, of sins, of your sins. And the result was that those who accepted were baptized, and the Bible tells us about 3,000 were added to the Jerusalem church on that day. So the application. One, we have a message to bring to the culture. This is the mission of the church and the command of our Lord and Savior to you and to me. Two, it's not our message. We should not confuse this. It's not our message. It's God's saving, God's saving message. 
We're the message bearers. And keeping in mind uh, some of Graves' comments, thirdly, we do need to be bold. As one writer put it, we need to, quote, to know Jesus and what his gospel work means for the world. To know Jesus, be clearly about who he is. This is being Christian in a confusion, confusing culture. This is how we're called to live. End of quote. That's the challenge that's before us today in our current generation as followers of Christ. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, which empowers us to be, to be witnesses to what you have done in our lives and for so many others over the centuries. We thank you, Lord, that uh, you only not only give us boldness to witness, that you also pave the way. Help us to remember that the message is not ours, that it's not a, con- that it's not a message that uh, we shout at people and yell at people and be arrogant about, but we, we speak the truth with love. We, are remember, we remember to follow the principles and ways of our Lord and Savior. We serve others and love others and tell them about Jesus. So, Lord, thank you for this, and I ask that you would just uh, uh, bless everyone that is watching and hearing this. Thank you for them, Lord, and may they be encouraged to, to be the message carrier in their place, wherever they may be. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here, and maybe uh, someone uh, in viewing uh, the viewing world, the listening world, um, has uh, listened to this kind of stuff for the very first time, and maybe the Holy Spirit has tweaked your heart or moved you in a certain direction, uh, please understand that God is, God is a God of love. He does ask you to really examine your heart, to, to confess your sin, to repent, to turn away from your life and turn to God and receive uh, the salvation is offered through Jesus Christ, for he has done all the work on the cross. You, you just step forward in faith. And I, and I pray if, you, if you're not there yet that you will get there, and my prayers are with you. And uh, just thank you again so much for being here with me. God bless and uh, shalom.